Welcome to Warpforge. Welcome, Eric Meyer. <laughs> uh, Eric um, likes to hash things. If you can hash something <laughs> and use it as indices, uh, then Eric wants to build software around it. And he also has uh, two other talks uh, here at GPN you want to, might, uh, want to check out. And the third talk now, today, is Warpforge, which uh, is a kind of, which wants to do reproducible builds. So if you do continuous integration and if you use containers and you ever had a problem with that or it's not as reprodu reproducible as you thought it would be, maybe Warpforge, Warpforge will be your solution. Thank you. Perfect introduction, thank you. Hello, I am Eric. Uh, this talk is about Warpforge. It is a tool for building anything, hopefully fast, hopefully repeatedly with hermetic environments, aiming for reliability, and uh, in contrast to some other systems, uh, really paying attention to communicating so that you can build things with friends. I also go by Warp Fork on the internet. All of the slides are under that name. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter there if you want to bug me later. Hopefully this is a nice mnemonic graphic for that name. This talk is going to come in uh, several phases. In the very beginning, I'm going to complain a lot about the state of the world as it is today, because we have things that need improving. Uh, in the middle, and for most of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, systems for building software and fixing the way we handle build descriptions, um, focusing on how we can share things and how we can fix software supply chains. Um, there will be liberal application of cryptographic hashes throughout. In the end, I'm going to be stuck talking just a little bit about um, packaging and how we approach that so that it is easier to share things within the systems that I want to live with. There's going to be a tool called Warpforge introduced, which is going to be a lot about fixing the builds and the supply chains. And then there's also going to be some conventions around uh, how to package things that are more of a suggestion at the end, but I hope a good and interesting suggestion. So, motivation. I use computers. This means I have to build software. I don't actually want to build software half the time, though. I would actually even just like to use software. In order to use software, I end up needing to install software. This requires the software to be distributed in some way. At some point, it was built and compiled. Probably I have a problem with it someday, so I need to patch it. And then I need to compile it again, and then I want to use it and share it. There can be a lot of steps in that process of making software available to people. And I wish that these were simple steps. I want to build all sorts of things. And once I've done so, I want to install them anywhere. And I want that to be simple. I want that to involve as few tools as possible. But I think the state of the world today is that building software is weirdly difficult. It involves a lot of manual effort. Usually, if you're building some kind of open source software, you're going to go look at the project readme, do a bunch of stuff using your like human willpower, your limited attention span, reading this and figuring out how to install the dependencies of the thing. Maybe you use some system package manager, maybe you use some language package manager. Almost certainly you use both. The incantations might depend on what kind of machine you have. It's a fundamentally unscientific process in which you have to guess a great deal and try stuff. We manage to survive with this, but it's, it's rough sometimes. And if you want reproducible environments and reproducible outcomes, especially if you want to try to detect bugs that only appear in some combinations of versions of libraries, good luck. Most of our tools will not help us with this today. This could be improved upon. My anecdote to hammer this point home is I tried to build something from source the other day, and it was rough. I picked a random project off of GitHub that I thought was cool, and I ended up needing to install GCC. Then I needed make. A make file tried to get a different malloc library. It asked for root to do that. That was uncomfortable. I discovered I could use the system package manager to get that, but it was guesswork to discover that. By the time I got through building this one selected open source project, which is, by the way, really cool, and I'm not picking on the one named here, but this is just like a real story that happened last week. I needed about 15 different things. I needed one language. I needed a package manager for that language. I needed a package package manager. Um, installing the latest package managers in Node was a journey of get Node, get NPM, use NPM to get core pack, use core pack to get yarn, then use yarn to get more packages. That was fun. None of those things were a pinned version. I ended up building stuff across multiple languages, 
uh, implicitly bash was used as glue. GCC got involved and I definitely needed my system package manager for GCC. By the time I was done, I don't know how many other C libraries I depended on. I have no idea. It was unclear to me. I didn't S chase GCC, so I don't know what happened. All of these things should have been versioned together if I wanted any kind of reproducibility or like a clue what just happened in my environment. And none of them were. I think the total count here is about 15. I might have forgotten some. So this is the state of the world that I want to improve upon. I want all of the supply chains, all of the things that went into this process to be identified and to be reproducible and ideally with no action for me, like should be a clear log. That's focusing on the build side. Even installing software, though, if I've built it, can be very difficult. I tried to install Emacs the other day. I, I honestly failed. I found that apt on my system. I'm an Ubuntu user. Make fun of me if you want. I know it's very common, very basic. It could give me an outdated version. Or I could install a PPA from some other person on the internet. That turned out not to work. I don't know why. I got tired of debugging it. Or I could find another version of this package in Flatpak. But then it works strangely because it had some default sandboxes. It couldn't find my actual like .emacs in my home drive. I don't know what was going on. Or I could use a totally different distro. You know what? I don't want to make fun of Lisp, but <laughs> installing things should be easy. Installing things should be about as easy as unpacking a tarball. And that's not the experience that I have today. I experience complete system distributions that want to own everything about my computer and like determine every part of the world in order to provide the first iota of utility. This is really frustrating. We should have more composable systems than this. Honestly, installing something should be open a tarball. OK, so these are the dreams that I have. And existing systems have maybe tried to improve the world. Like Linux distributions exist to try to make computers usable. But I don't think that they do. If you're going to use a Linux distribution, you have to buy into everything about that distro. It's a whole machine thing. And this means it's not really satisfactory if I want to have a dream of a universal build tool that you can use freely to do whatever you want and expect other people to come with you as well. I think Linux distros are even quite questionable as install tools because the norm in them is to make sure you only have one of a thing. And I don't, I don't want that, right? And I don't think anybody really does. Like, NVM appears in order to help people get different versions of Node.js, for example. Like, people want to bisect on different versions of things. This is normal. Linux distros fight you, almost all of them. It's really strange. In practice, the reason that this often comes about, I think, has something to do with ELF library headers and silly errata that are utterly fixable. The latter half of the talk will get into this. So what I want to hammer home about distros and what's not what I want about them is Linux distros try to solve problems of usable computers by making everything fit into their own universe and be compatible with themselves. I want to produce software that anyone can use in any universe. And that's a different challenge. Now, maybe you've been listening to this series of complaints and thinking, ah, containers. Containers give us hermetic environments. That solves tons of things about building and distributing. Well, it's a start. But I'm afraid that containers are a necessary but not sufficient sort of thing. Containers are like having a clean room to do science in. And then the first thing you do is go outside, get a bucket of whatever dirt there is out on the street, and you pour it into your clean room. And now you try to build. <laughs> there's twigs, there's leaves. I did actually go get a bucket of mud from the street. You don't know what's in that. And that's very hard then to work with, to produce like clean, understandable things. Having the clean room, good. Not knowing what you put into it, and then being stuck as many container systems are with a whole just heap of monolithic image, it doesn't help at all. It also ends up not helping with the install story. Containers have caught on very nicely in like Kubernetes and things that uh, are microservice networking, because there they're composable. The actual file system part of containers, like if I want to have a series of processes execing each other, there's no usable composition story here. So this doesn't solve a lot of problems that I want solved. 
We need more composable systems than this. Now I'm going to jump ahead to a couple of other comparisons with other things that are more relevant real quick here, because I think people probably won't listen to the rest of my proposal until they know that everything else has been considered. So Docker, containers. Containment is good, but I want something way more than monolithic images. Another tool that exists already and kind of exists in this build anything domain that I want to explore is Bazel. Bazel is really close to being what I want. Um, Warp Forge, this tool that I'm going to propose in a bit, is similarly a build sandbox and has like declarative languages for what we're going to do. Um, but there's a couple of things I want to like ratchet up from what Bazel did. Um, Warp Forge is going to focus even more than Bazel does on being hermetic. We're going to use containers and we're not going to let things escape them. Uh, Bazel has a very easy way of putting like container equals nah in its config. Uh, I don't like this. We're also going to focus a lot more in Warp Forge on having a way to communicate partial build instructions and snapshots of data. So my experience of Bazel and watching people use it is that it sort of assumes you have a monorepo. I want a much more decentralized system. I want to let people collaborate even across teams and like without synchronizing. This should be possible. So we're going to work a lot on that API. Warforge is also very likely to be compared to Nix, which is another functional declarative package manager. And like Bazel, close, really close to what I want. If you're familiar with Nix, you're probably familiar with the Nix language. Warforge is not going to have that. <laughs> Someone in the audience just says, yay. Yeah, um, I'm not going to pick on the Nix language too much, because I think you can just like search for that on the internet already. Um, Warpforge, suffice to say, is going to focus on APIs, message passing, like plain JSON stuff. We might introduce a templating language, but it will be optional. In contrast to Nix, Warpforge is also going to be content addressed by default, and that has huge ramifications that I'll get into in a Q&A section if somebody wants to go through that. So all that said, yes, I'm proposing a new system. I have seen this XKCD. I'm going to try to make something better anyway. I hope it works. So now on to the actual attempt at solving things. I'm going to offer us the system called Warpforge, which is going to be a tool for building, and a set of suggestions called WarpSys, for lack of a better title, which is going to be a style for packaging. Both of these are going to be fiercely independent from each other, even, and everything. I'm going to try to build the smallest possible reusable bits and proceed with those. Warpforge, the build tool, is going to be about building anything and solving that version together problem, that like list of 15 different things that I wish were connected somehow. We're going to try to connect that in Warpforge. The WarpSys recommendations are going to try to solve more of those composable systems requirements. So basically, this is solving builds and packaging. And I did have to cram both of these in the same talk because they end up functionally kind of interdependent, trying to minimize that. But you'll see where it shows up. So first, builds. First of all, I just want to demonstrate a tool exists. I'm offering you working software today, not just a series of pipe dreams. <laughs> uh, but I'll get more into demos later on. First, I want to go through the goals of this system. Uh, and then I'm actually going to drag us through the APIs of the system, because I think that's going to be the clearest way to see what it can really do. And then we'll have more demo screens introduced in the middle of that. So the goals. I want zero parameter total environments for my systems. I want to run things with no arguments and have them work once I've written some config files. But then I version control those, right? I want a software bill of material for everything that ever happens in the system. And I want this to be load bearing. I want the bill of materials of what goes into this to not just be like a log that comes out to the side making vague statements about maybe what happened. I want it to be something that I execute to prepare the environment. And then it is load bearing. So we know it's the truth. I want this to be done with hashes. <laughs> As I was introduced, I really like hashing things. I want a completely decentralized system. So every time there's data going in or out, I want it to be 
covered by a cryptographic hash, so I know exactly what it is. No DNS lookups should be involved in determining what is going on in this system, ever. And I want granular inputs. I want to avoid the monolithic image trap. I want to say where my input data goes. And sometimes I want to say which output data I save. Again, avoid the monolithic image trap. I don't want to have to snapshot an entire system every time I want to say, OK, the build output directory. Just that, please. That should be natural. Now the requirements start getting more complicated. I mentioned I want people to be able to collaborate with folks without being in lockstep in a monorepo. So I'm going to need some kind of format in the system to map human readable names to these hashes that are the identity of data that I'm passing around, and also to um, the identity of build instructions. And I need some way to share those. That's going to be fun. I want those things to work at all scales. So they have to be decentralized. I'm going to pour more hashes on it. There's going to be Merkle trees for days here. And because I want this to be able to work for almost any sort of process, um, we're going to need graphs and pipelines. And then we just got the soft goals of be usable and um, be optional, actually. I want something that you can drop in every Git repo you ever use, and it's helpful to you. Or if you don't want to use it, well, OK, fine. You can go back to like reading the readme the hard way. So these different goals are going to be covered by um, several different API concepts in the system. These are all uh, headers of chapters that are going to come up. There's also some goals that just require being careful. And there's one more huge goal that I've already alluded to several times, which is everything must be API driven in the system. I want messages. I do not want programming languages. I don't want my favorite programming language. I don't want anyone's favorite programming language. I want APIs. It should be easy to give instructions to the build system via API messages. It should be easy to get results in API messages, plain JSON. I should be able to pipe things from this build system to JQ. That should work. If that works, it should also make the system very easy to debug and easy to have audit logs of. That just seems natural, right? OK, moving on. That was a lot of goals. And credit to every other project in this space, because I know that this will this is competitive to many other things that many other people work on. This is a very hard space, solving all of these goals. Holy smokes. So thank you, everyone who's ever tried to build software. <laughs> we all tried. OK, so Warforge has a series of API layers. I'm going to start with the simplest ones. They're the most boring. They'll have the most hashes. Then in each consecutive layer, we're going to add a little more flexibility and utility. So in the beginning, Warforge has formulas. They mean very simply, hashes go in, you do something, and hashes are going to come out. It looks kind of like this JSON object. This is an executable thing in Warforge. In the inputs map in JSON, this is a boring one, by the way. It only has one input, but that slash there, that's a mount path. You can put more stuff in this map. Content comes in by hash. You can have a section where a bash script or your choice of thing, exit, there's options here, does something. And once you're done, you can say, I want an output from this path, pack it in a tarball, please, and put this label on it. This, this is the fundamental unit of execution in Warforge. And you can run such a thing as this. Warforge run, the formula. So here's a demo that runs around with some CSV. You can see at the bottom, this also kicked out another JSON object. Yes, APIs. This JSON object that it kicks out is called a run record. And it has a section of results where the keys in this map match what you asked for. That's it. This is a simple primitive. Also exit code, you know, useful. This is going to be the foundation of everything else that happens in Warpforge. These things are at the bottom of everything. If you want the most granular logging imaginable, you just log these things, and you will see exactly what is happening. Because there's also hashes all over the place, it should make it super easy to check uh, anything you're doing for determinism. If you wanted to know, oh, I have lost the screen. How did this happen? OK, that double time. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to hope that the formulas thing was on the stream already. OK, cool. JSON everywhere. Great. Moving on. Um, 
By the way, I did use containers for that. Containers aren't lame. It's monolithic images that are lame. Composable input system makes them good. So these formulas, these JSON objects, these are the bottom of our universe in WarpForge. If you're thinking that they're verbose and that they're limited, yes, that is also the case. If you use just this API level, you would be copying and pasting hashes all the time, and that would obviously suck. You have work to get done, so do I. So more abstractions will come. I don't know why I put this slide in this order, but by the way, there's schemas for everything. That's good, right? The next layer of API up, stepping to like layer two of APIs in WarpForge, is something called plots. These are going to let us do uh, multiple steps of things, whole graphs even, not just linearly. And it's going to start introducing features that will help us avoid copying and pasting hashes. So it'll start associating human-readable names with inputs and outputs, and some more stuff too. So here's an example plot object. This looks a little bit similar to, it has things that look a bit like formulas in the real, right? This has two formulas, step one, step two. These are obviously all dummy values, but you can get the idea. These things are wired together by pipes, if you will. So you might have noticed that, did my cursor show up? Yeah, great. Uh, inputs in formulas were always the keyword where, followed by a, a pack type instruction, so like, please use a tarball, followed by some hash. Now in plots, we can use other things in addition to where's. For example, this pipe reference. This one has a empty in the middle here and then the word thingy. It's because it's coming up to the top level and putting thingy in here. Down below in this step two, this pipe is referring to step one, the output called stuff. All right, you see how this goes. You can build graphs. You can also run plots. So this is a bigger example of doing some stuff with a shell, counting words. And you can run a whole plot and it will run a series of containers in sequence. You can see how the uh, hashes are coming out in the middle, and it's basically just getting stamped into the next part of the plot. So this lets you do bigger, more interesting stuff. Um, here's an unmoving snapshot of the same thing. You can see how this hash is like coming from right up here. Cool. You could have glued this together by using the execution of formulas and like JQ and some bash glue and stuff, but Everybody would have to write that same glue, so we build it into the system. Now, more interestingly, plots are going to start using um, some of the communication tools that are so important to letting people collaborate without monorepos and so on. That first example just used a where ID in the beginning. Soon, we're going to introduce another system called catalogs, which are going to map a human-readable name to a hash like that. Catalogs are going to get another um, heading momentarily. Uh, other stuff that, why does this need so many transitions? Okay. Um, plots can also use a, another system called ingests. Now this is a little bit spicy because this is going to let you do impure things and it's going to let you look at the host. This keyword at the bottom here. You can use a git ingest, for example, to look at a git repo in the current working directory on your host and get the head commit. Warforge knows what git is and it can do this. The key concept of using ingests is that, oh, first of all, WarpForge is going to warn you because it's doing impure things, and it's not going to let you like go wild with this. And also, it's going to immediately turn it into a where. So like this will get sort of transformed into the string where colon git colon the git hash. OK, so now it's time to move on to the communication parts and introduce what that catalog bit was about. Catalogs are going to be a data structure for sharing information about both the data that you have produced in the system or imported into it, as well as, how's my time? Uh, how's my train of thought? Um, bringing data into the system, identifying it, also tracking uh, rebuild instructions for anything that we've built in the system. So these are just going to be a huge repository of knowledge. And they're going to be designed as a Merkle tree. If you're not familiar with that, in brief, it means a series of hashes where each thing covers the thing under it. Git is a Merkle tree. It's why you can trust Git repos, generally. So a catalog is going to start with a human-readable name for some project. It's going to contain another human-readable string for release versions. And then it's going to point to another document by hash. In that next document, it will contain a third tuple of the human-readable name, so attributes like source and architecture tuples go in this part of the system. And then finally, we get a content hash. 
There's also some freeform metadata that can be inserted in here. This is meant to be an extensible system. Um, in this example, there's also something called a replay shown here, which will be how we do sharing rebuild instructions. And more examples of that will come in a minute. Since catalogs are about sharing things with other people, it's also going to have to start talking about where to get data. This is a practical reality thing. So you can associate um, a mirrors document with a catalog and give URLs for fetching individual uh, content hashes. Or you can say anything under this like glob of name, go get from this content addressable bucket. There's a bunch of options there. And this is how we then make these names usable in plots. So when a plot uses a catalog reference, here's your three tuple. You split this on the colon character and then go look it up in a catalog. Now, this seems like maybe I did something impure, right? The key element of catalogs is that we're going to make sure that every time you have a plot, that's a file that you put in version control. And every time you have a catalog, that needs to be in the same version control structure, meaning you're going to have one hash that covers all of these things, assuming you're using a sensible version control system. So these catalogs can be projected onto a file system. I'm going to start going really fast because we've lost a bunch of time in the um, technical difficulties. And catalogs are where you can also bridge data in and out of the system. For example, there's a bunch of subcommands of WarpForge which will let you look at a Git repo, get all the tags out of it, and instantaneously transform those into a catalog. That's cool. Here we're doing it on Linux. All right, recap of the API structure so far. Formulas, do one thing. Plot, do a bunch of things. Catalogs, start communicating. The other thing we're going to put in catalogs is the replay data structure. These are to communicate builds that you have done before and let you do them again. This is actually really easy. I don't even need to show a new API object for this because it was already plots. If you used any ingests, that would be unreproducible. So we're going to freeze those, but then it's already a replay. This is something that we do in practice if you want like a git repo for your source on your host. You can say, yeah, use that. And when you're releasing, as long as you put an output in the system that contains that same information, we can just like automatically freeze that into a self-reference. This lets anybody else who ever wants to reproduce this run do so from the information already available in the catalog, because that will then be the git content hash. These replay files go in the catalog, along all of that other data. And something I want to highlight is cool about how this works. Especially this is contrastable to other um, pure functional build systems. Catalogs are based on this concept of snapshotting the data and having the hash of the data and then associating the replay instructions with that. Which is cool because you can actually have cycles, right? We kind of just saw one right here. You can make a cyclic reference. And that's fine because you're snapshotting it after the cycle is completed. This means we can explain even build graphs that have cycles which is really cool if you wanted to, say, fix the trusting trust attack of compilers. Replays also, of course, let us build stuff. Um, if you're missing some content and you want to recursively build it from the replay instructions, you just add dash r to the run command. It's great. All of this stuff, when you're running it in practice, takes um, place in a workspace, which uh, in WarpForge is basically any directory that has a .warpforge directory. This is where the scope of name lookups are. So that catalog file system, it goes in this directory. Workspaces can be nested for practicality reasons. So you can have one root workspace, which contains a bunch of catalogs that you imported from the internet. And these can be used as like autocomplete suggestions or so on. And then our recommendation is that you should put another, no, nope, that's not the slide I had. Um, Every Git repo, every version control root should itself also contain a workspace, because we want that catalog snapshot and the module to be next to each other, the plot next to each other. So we have vendoring tools that can take all of the references from your root workspace and copy them into a smaller one. So when you're using the tool in practice, you can ask it for the status of some module, like our build instructions for Python. And it will say, yeah, you have these references to these catalogs. 
I would love to explain these things more slowly, but I'm quite worried about my time. So put these in a Git repo, you're off to the races. It's vendoring of lightweight metadata that's going to let you reproduce stuff. Now, you're still writing lots and lots of JSON. And if you want to do lots of things very efficiently, you probably want to write less JSON, or you want to have some reuse layer. Now, at this point, I'm actually going to give up a little tiny bit and not necessarily solve it totally in WarpForge, because I want to avoid having my own personal opinions about programming languages reduce the number of people who can share this tool. So bring your own JSON object generator, please. Or, OK, yes, I'm going to include at least one batteries included answer. Starlark from Bazel is actually kind of cool. It's a Python dialect. We're going to introduce support for this into the core of WarpForge. It's going to be non-special. It's just going to emit JSON objects. So if you want to build a competing system, you can just do that, and I'm not going to fight you. But I want something batteries included. This is still a work in progress, so this syntax is wildly non-final, but the idea is having a language gives you some degree of being able to reuse concepts and components. Yeah. So in recap, formulas, well, you do basic stuff. Plots and these other structures let you do graphs of it, and then catalogs let you communicate it. And then at some layers above this, you can introduce whatever kind of templating you want. Maybe I'll offer some Starlark, and that's the batteries included easy option. But anything you want to do is fine. As long as you're producing these structures like plots and replays, the whole system can still introspect, understand what you're doing, produce good audit logs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a couple of other cool things, like we have quick commands for like, oh, you want an interactive shell? All right, fine, we can have this. Um, you can have localhost CI in this system basically for free. You use a git ingest. All of this works rootlessly, just for the record. You never need sudo for any of this. OK, now as I continue to run low on time, briefly, packaging. <laughs> yes, we're starting to package things in this system. Mostly, I'm trying not to care about any details of that except for one thing. I want binary packages to be path agnostic. By which I mean, if I put them in some install folder, I want it to work. This is a handy attribute because it makes it easy to compose things with this kind of JSON. Um, and it's also very high in mechanical sympathy to containers in general. I want zero step installs. I want no post install hooks so that when I put an application in a file system, it should be a read only mount and it can go. That just makes sense to me, like from first principles, but it's also like fantastic for container usage because it means you can use a bind mount and just like go to space. If you have things that need to be moved around on a file system in a container, uh, an overlay FS will cause all sorts of like invisible copy operations on the bottom, things get really slow. If you can have application installs that you just mount and you're done, you are a happy person. If you've packaged binaries in Linux before, you might know that this is harder than it should be. ELF headers are kind of nuts. I'm not going to explain every part of how you fix this, but long story short, there is a way that you fix this. You can play with ELF headers in Linux such that you can have libraries be relative to the path of the binary. If you follow this to its conclusion, you can have directories that you can mount in any position, and they will work. This is a way to start building reusable components that do not need any support from the system around them whatsoever. This is a way to get out of the trap of distros building into their own universe. I've given a talk about this before as well, back at All Systems Go in 2018. There's a much longer rant about the needs for this and the effects that it will have, if you want more information. Or you can follow these links to like working implementations. There's one more thing that comes up if you're stitching together lots and lots of applications, each in their own directory like that. At some point, you need a path, the thing that your um, shell looks at to pick where a binary comes from. Use a symlink farm. This is a solvable problem. That's it. I don't care about anything else in packaging. I just want things to work together by being isolated. And it can be done. 
OK. All of these systems that I have introduced are early. There is working software. And if people want to come to those links and like get binaries, try them out later, please do. However, it's early. We're trying to build APIs and like sort of functional spaces where people can get together and build stuff in the future. Um, as demos, there are some packages for like GCC and Python floating around. Um, but there is so much more stuff to do to make a practical environment with lots of packages. If anyone in this room or anyone watching would like to come along and help with that, please. <laughs> we have lots of future work in the tooling. The Starlark thing, like I said, is coming up. Many other things that we would like. And I would like to package more stuff as well. We are currently resisting building a distro. And I hope we continue to resist doing that. But if we follow some of these packaging recommendations, and we can produce things that are reproducible, hermetic, and easy to rebuild with Warp Forge, and are usable everywhere, gosh, that would be cool. So anything that anyone sees in here and they want to help make it better, please um, come talk to me later. It will take many people. Hopefully, if we are successful in this project, it will produce a cultural shift. I want reproducible builds to happen. And I hope that this tool and the way that it exposes hashes and makes things visible and debuggable will actually help us get there. Not necessarily by solving reproducible builds themselves, like patches to everything that has some random component is necessary to fix that thing. But this tool chain should help make that visible and help make it fixable. I'm hoping that this eventually makes computers easier to use. And I'm hoping that these packaging conventions mean more people can share more stuff and honestly make the world a better place. I think I've made it through in halfway decent time. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Maybe. How is my time? <laughs> no, your time was great. So we have uh, 12 more minutes for questions, which is more than we expected. This is great. You made up time great. So uh, yeah. Raise your hand if you have a question, and uh, I will pass you the microphone. Yes, you can. Uh. What kind of uh, tools or languages are you using to build this? Oh, good question. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if, yeah um, is the mic? <laughs> can you show me the mic for a second? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Try again. Try again. Yes, please. So what kind of tools and languages are you using uh, to build this? So all of the Warp Forge tooling is built in Golang at the moment. Um, I try not to treat that as too interesting of a choice. Um, but lots of things in Golang are very practical. It's also very easy to get reproducible builds out of the Go compiler. So we have like Warp Forge building Warp Forge with a consistent hash already, which is very pleasing. Um, the container system, we're reusing RunC. It works. Um, it's the same thing that's at the bottom of Docker stack in practice in almost any install. Um, but RunC is just the containing parts and none of the like image transport parts, which means like thank you, whoever isolated that API. It's like very correct. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, also, lots of things are pluggable. So like where the hash said where colon tar colon bleh, um, there's a whole plugin system there for these uh, transport and hashing systems. So if you wanted to plug in, somebody mentioned IPFS earlier, that should be easy. There is like a switch case where you can start dropping more code in. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, please. Hi. Um, is it on? Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this quite interesting work. And uh, the first thing I was wondering if I want to start putting my tool of choice, which I wrote into the system, do I really have to um, make packages for all of the dependencies, including GCC and all of the compilers? Because I think it kind of comes down to like everything should be built in that system, isn't it? So you can use the system in a pretty degenerate way of just like do the whole monolithic snapshot thing like other container systems and then build. Um, if you want like a quick escape valve to let you do something without thinking about it too much, you can do that. And of course, we're doing that like constantly as we bootstrap things as well. 
Uh, I'm hoping that we will build a larger ecosystem of packages very quickly that will make it easier to do more stuff faster. Like, we do have a GCC and a Python already, for example. We even have a path agnostic Python, by the way, which is really cool. Uh, I don't think anyone else on the planet has that. Um, but yeah, uh, inevitably, there's going to be a lot of stuff that needs to get built in order to have the nicest possible experience. Um, I hope the fallback to monolithic snapshot helps people accomplish things in increments as well. Okay, more questions. Yes, yes. So, uh, at least if you are using something like Gentoo, you probably ran uh, into issues with like GitHub uh, changing the toggle we give you off, but basically, and that obviously breaks uh, hashes. Um, you got any solutions to that one? Because uh, one thing which could work, for example, is not relying uh, on the toggle GitHub, for example, provides, but uh, doing a shallow clone of the repository itself or something. Yep. Um. Yeah, I remember the day that GitHub changed their hashing algorithm, or their exact um, export algorithm. That was, that was fun, good times. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could solve that. I think just mirroring the actual binary data is like always your, your ground truth, this can never hurt you sort of a choice. Um, the transport plugin system is also part of my answer to that. So um, this tar system we're currently using actually does a semantic hash of the tarball, believe it or not. I wrote that code. Um, it means that you're immune to some of the details. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. You're giving me a thumbs up, but I actually don't know if I regret this or not. It's a, more code to maintain, and that's worse. Um, but it does mean that we're immune to some things like the tar file order. The actual hash in that system is based on like the syscalls that I give to the file system, so it's correct and nothing additional. Nothing about the um, compression algorithm either, for example. Um, But yeah, at some point you just have to have the data available, right? Like we're going to use cryptographic hashes, so if you can't keep that data around, at some point you're going to have fragility issues. Yeah, since we're on the roll, more questions? Oh yes, yes. Also, you can repeat the questions that you that the stream didn't hear. Uh, how would you compare Warpforge to uh, Bitbag or from the Open Embedded ecosystem? Um, from compared to what? Uh, Bitbag. Bitbag. Um, oh heck, I'm less Just, than familiar with that one. You should look at it because mm. it's basically similar in, in many many ways to, to what you're building here, regarding reproducible builds using hashes to to yeah, exchange artifacts to see which parts change and which parts can be reused. Cool. Uh, if more people are trying to approach the same goals, that's fantastic. Um, Mostly what I have seen from other systems, and I'm not sure if this is true of Bitbake, is that people are working on having build trees. Um, and there's less emphasis on the communicable subcomponents and like being able to detach. Whereas something that's very unique about Warpforge is uh, every time there's a catalog, you can detach. Those are like points where you can collaborate with other people asynchronously. Um, but I'm less than familiar with Bitbake, so I'll have to research that later. Okay, we might have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes, last question. Maybe it's not uh, really a question, but uh, an idea. Um, I think you, you have a lot of work to do building a very large catalog. And uh, maybe you already come, came across the idea, but did you ever thought about um, there are a lot of um, distributions which already have a lot of recipes how to build software? in trying to invest into writing um, a software which converts that build recipes into your recipes. I think it will be kind of hard because most of, of them are having like programming languages which are Turing complete. That's yep. a little bit annoying, but um, I think maybe you can make a first guess and then get a recipe which like 90% works and then you do some hot fixing or things like that and then you, you can build a lot of a large catalog fast. 
uh, I've definitely not tried to automate things at that tier, but I will say that there are some distros that I enjoy looking at the source code of a lot more than others. Um, <laughs> looking at Arch is usually a fantastic source of inspiration. It's Bash, oh no, but like it's usually very like linear and you can tell what's going on very quickly. Um, so those have been generally inspirational. But usually, um, yeah, you still end up with some manual transformations and I have no idea what we're going to do once we get Starlark in the system, by the way. All the stuff we've packaged so far, we're writing JSON files. And so our copy pasta level is still like a little bit high. Like there's certain incantations for how to do the, um, the R path twiddling and then the LD shim thing that are like manually copy pasted right now. Um, so I think we're going to end up with some sort of functional templating system to do that. And I don't know what it's going to look like yet. So there'll be lots more to discover once we get there. OK. Um, yeah, maybe one, one short more question, if there is one. Yeah, otherwise, I think this is a good point to end the talk and give the next uh, people more time to prepare, or at least some time, because we had the technical difficulties. Thank you, Eric. It was a great talk. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent questions. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us with the... <laughs> oh, oh, I had one more slide that I should flash. Um, here's all the links to all of the things. <laughs> you can get more documentation at projectname.io, warpforge.io. Uh, source code's here. It's under my personal username on GitHub. Um, here's where we're packaging stuff so far, so there's a bunch of JSON files there. And if you want to chat, um, please do. I'm a Matrix fanboy, so that's where I'll be. But it is also bridged to the same name on uh, Libera if you're IRC people. So please come hang out. I'll be lurking there momentarily. Thank you again. <laughs>